Hello and welcome to the Total Clarity Podcast. I'm Jesse Hyatt. And I'm Mike Varley, and this is episode four of the podcast. Now you may be wondering, since there's only three episodes out, how it is that we're on episode four. We actually recorded an episode last week, but it didn't really match the tone of what was going on right now. We actually did talk about the topic of George Floyd's death, uh, but we did it as an outside episode, and the last half hour where we talked about George Floyd's death, there was some music playing in the background, and it really kind of droned out what we were saying, and it didn't really seem appropriate to release something that was substandard relative to the topic. Yeah, yeah, we figured it's a, it's a big topic. We are by no means experts. There's a lot of people talking about it. There's a lot of people saying really important things, and we'll still release that episode. It was the parts of the episode that did get recorded well, that the audio sounded well, were really lighthearted and fun, and we learned a lot about our friend's business and had a great conversation, so we look forward to sharing that with you in the future. But for now, we're just going to share three and four out of order. That's right. So not quite sure when that's coming out. Hopefully, we'll pick the right moment that seems appropriate for the time. But for now, it's shelved, and we'll get back to it at some point. But as far as the moment itself, we were having ongoing discussions about whether or not to do the podcast or what seemed appropriate. And we decided that we wanted to do the podcast. Uh, we wanted to have an episode that was specifically about the topic of George Floyd's death and the protests going on and police in general and things like that. And we also thought it made sense to just have the episode be the two of us so that we could really kind of get our thoughts down just ourselves and kind of build from there. In addition to that, I spent some time today going back to our website and thinking about the project that we were intending to start on March 21st and still intend to and how some of the project pillars, as we're describing them, met up with the moment right now. So if you were to go to our website and you go to the about section, there's a description of four pillars, PCCC, physicality, companionship, communication, and clarity. And so I'm just looking at it now on my phone. I was going to read off some of the things. We wanted to make sure that pretty much anything that we endeavor on during this year hits at least two of those. If there isn't something, if it only hits one, it's probably only somewhat relevant and not worth the effort relative to the massive undertaking we're intending to do once it starts. So anything that has two or more is worth our consideration. And I thought that what we're doing right now, discussing this topic, covers three. So starting with the idea of companionship, if you go look on the site, we have a bunch of bullet points under each thing. So for companionship, utilizing our current life circumstances of intentioned interaction. So we have intended for this entire year to be an opportunity for the two of us to be together mm -hmm. and to think things through. And this seems like an opportunity to do that, you know, to see if we're on the same page. Also, combining concerted effort for a mutual goal. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is something that through this discussion, maybe we could find a, a pathway through that makes more sense from when we started it. Sure. A mutual goal, I think... When we wrote that, we were thinking about ourselves, but we're also in a time where there's so many people coming together for a mutual goal that's way beyond ourselves. So that still applies to that too. Yeah, for sure. And then the final one from that section, celebrating disparate experience in a parallel commitment. Now, as far as we thought how that applied to the walk, we'd be doing you know, these long distance walks but having potentially different experiences of those walks. Mm -hmm. For this, we may have different experiences of what exactly is going on in the world, mm -hmm. but we can figure out a way to combine those experiences to create something that's a shared meaning, mm -hmm. which I think is ideally what we should strive for as a society, but we can really only start in units of two. So that's all from the companionship section. 
So from the communication section, there were three as well that I thought were relevant. Expression of experience in a benevolent manner, which mm -hmm. I think is something that I know I would like to practice moving forward when it comes to thinking about this issue. Mm -hmm. Although I think we'll get to this later. I don't know if that is necessarily the only means of expression in this time sure. is in, in a benevolent th in manner. Well, I think, sorry if I cut you off, no, of but I think we wrote these for ourselves, right? These aren't rules for other people to follow by any means, but these are, this is just a list that we wrote for you and me particularly. So if that's something that we are striving towards, I think that we can keep holding ourselves to that. But by no means does that mean that other people need to be expressing themselves in a benevolent manner. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is just reflective of our values and how we wish to live in the world. Sure. Exactly. Another one that seemed relevant was expression with meaning and principle, mm -hmm. which I think we just demonstrated by <laughs> elaborating on that last point. <laughs> And then uh, the final one from this section, intentional openness in encountered dialogue. Mm -hmm. Now, that is something that we'd be doing a lot of while walking around, encountered mm -hmm. dialogue. Not something that's going to happen immediately as a consequence. Like, it's not going to happen in this room. Sure. But potentially, ideally, hopefully, people will listen to this and have feedback and then we will maintain that openness as we receive feedback. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, and I think just between the two of us, we are seeing different things and talking to different people and have different experiences of our own. So we might even be giving each other feedback that right. we need to be open to. Yeah. And then finally, the clarity section. Honestly, all five of the points that are listed there seem relevant. So I'll, I'll run through them very quickly. Pursuit of personal clarity, pursuit of paired clarity, pursuit of communal clarity, pursuit through outward awareness, and pursuit through inward awareness. Mm. So I'm not really sure I have much more to add on that other than the idea of it being a value to us to try and use effort to get to a place of further understanding rather than rather than allow ambiguity to just be the way that things are. Mm. So now that we've covered that, Jesse has some interesting research she's been doing over the past couple of days that I don't even know about. I just know that she's been doing it. And it has to do with the New York City budget and then more narrowly the NYPD budget. So yeah, I'm excited to hear what it is that you've dug up. Do you want to dive into that? Right away? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Well, so just a little background in why I decided to look into it. I want to say that I would think everyone watching this probably would understand already, but I don't know if that's true. So I'm just going to explain it. So throughout the last eight days of protesting, I've been hearing a lot of people say defund the police. And I didn't understand what that meant. Um, so I looked into it, I did some research. I mean, I Googled, what does it mean? What does defunding the police mean? And I found 25 articles about it. So if you don't get it, you can also Google it, but we're also gonna talk about it here. And I was confused because I thought, okay, the police are this massive force. It's linked to so many different parts of our culture and our society. How can you just defund the, like defund to me means completely rid them of all of the money. And there are actually some people that want to do that. But for the most part, what I'm finding is that what it really means is let's take money from what's allocated to the police and reallocate it to things such as mental health services or homeless services or other social services that could be called instead of the police. So if you're involved in 
domestic violence, for example, and you just need someone to help you get out of your house. Maybe the police aren't the best people to call for that. They're not actually trained specifically for situations like that, but there could be other organizations that are trained for that, and it would be better to just put funds towards those organizations, get people numbers to call them, rather than always having to call 911, and then ultimately ending up with these people that really aren't trained to deal with all the nuances of the troubles that we face in society. So that makes sense to me. I get that. I'm on board. And then I wanted to know, because I don't think that it's really enough just to say defund the police, reallocate funds without knowing what are the funds? How much do the police even get right now? And what do these other services get? I think my first thought was, and I think I've thought about this for a long time, thinking about education and thinking about how it seems like schools are underfunded. It seems, especially public schools, don't seem to get enough money. And that was where my mind went first. I also was thinking about homeless people right away. And so I just looked into what the city budget looks like. And I did a lot of Googling about that. And it's hard to find. It's mm -hmm. really hard to find information about the New York City budget. And I assume maybe that's like that in every city. But I can only speak to our city. And I told you that I was Googling it, right? I mm -hmm. told you that I wanted to learn this and I couldn't find anything. And you suggested that I reach out to our friend Julia, mm -hmm. and I did. And Julia Friedenberg, she um, does work with the city council. And so she sent me exactly what I was looking for, mm -hmm. which was amazing. And what it was, and so if anyone wants to look for themselves, it's budget.council.nyc, and it's a budget explorer. So it's this colorful uh, graph like infographic that shows you each of the different departments in the city and how much money they get, how much is allocated to them. It's focusing on the 2021 budget right now. Mm -hmm. Budget.council.nyc. Budget.council.nyc. We should put that in the little mm -hmm. notes. Yeah, on the YouTube we will. On the YouTube. Yeah. So anyway, so that's a great web it's a great resource. It breaks everything down by department. You can click through into each department, and then it further itemizes it. It's a little bit, it's still complicated. It's still not super citizen user friendly because I just don't know a lot of the terms. Mm -hmm. I don't like, and then there's also multiple different, so for example, the police, because that's where we started this conversation with, there were, there's a, line that you can click into for pay and fringe benefits. Then there's also charges, services, and, and expenses. There's patrol services. There's offices of special narcotics. And they're, they're all in separate bubbles. Mm -hmm. So it's not just going to one thing and then it breaks it all down. And then even when you're in there, it's kind of, it, like I said, just because of the terms, I don't fully understand. Julia did say that I could contact her and ask if I had any questions, and I think I, I will, but for now, I was, I was, I've just been studying up until now. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I did find when I was trying to understand some of these terms, I went to the internal budget office, and there is, on their website, it's ibo.nyc.ny.us, <laughs> and they have a PDF, it's like a 16-page PDF just for understanding the budget. And that was actually really helpful. And so I think I'll start with that because on the first page there, it was explaining why do we need to understand the budget? Why do we even need to have a budget? And it said one of the main reasons is because there is never enough money to do it all, the budget reflects the priorities of the city's elected representatives. That, that was a quote on the first page. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really important to keep in mind just because that then reminds us how important it is to pay attention to these things and if we think that voting is important 
we can see here specifically the internal budget office says that the budget reflects the city's elected representatives priorities mm -hmm. that speaks for itself right so, <laughs> so another thing that that pdf broke down that i thought was really interesting is there was a list a full page list of what 10 million dollars buys okay and i just made some notes that i thought were interesting so can i read them to you yes okay so $10 million could pay for 132 new teachers for a year. Mm -hmm. The city currently employs about 75,000 teachers. Mm. $10 million also could pay for 213 homeless family shelter units for one year, which is about 1% of what the current average annual cost is. 1%, $10 million is 1% of the of annual... Of the current annual cost of homeless family shelter units. Okay. And that pays for 213 units. So we could do the math. That means that currently there's about, fast math, 20,000 shelter units. And this 10 million could add another 213. So $10 million could also pay for 72 police officers per year. The city currently employs about 23,800 police personnel that are at the rank of officer. It could also pay for 1.7 days of incarcerating the average daily population of inmates in city jails. And that average daily population is 9,790. Hmm. So one, only 1 1.7 days. Sorry, I shouldn't be. I'm trying to just read them as facts and not put my own feeling into it. But $10 million would pay for 1.7 days of the population of 9,790 incarcerated inmates. Yeah. That seems like a lot, but it also that incorporates the salaries of everybody that's involved in making that happen. I'm actually not clear on exactly what that incorporates, because like I said, this was just on the first, that first PDF that explains the budget. Mm -hmm. You're probably right, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. So then the last thing that I wrote down from that list is that the 10 million could also pay for 13,558 job placements through Workforce One Career Centers. And that number represents 48% of the workers that, have, that are typically hired in an average year through that program. Hmm. That seems ambiguous. I don't know what that, I mean, that is the effort of a job officer or whatever you would call that, a headhunter, whatever you would call that position so I, to fulfill a spot? So I looked into what Workforce One career centers are, mm -hmm. and there's these offices throughout the five boroughs, and I didn't take notes, so forgive me if I miss anything up, but it basically seems like just a, cert a service that helps people find work. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I would call it headhunters, but more more like a public service. Sure. So what you've just read suggests that police officers are the most expensive of all of that. Yeah. So what I just read does show that police officers and jails are the most expensive per person, I guess, per salary. So. There's only 72 police officers that could be paid for with the $10 million. And as opposed to that you could, you know, pay 132 teachers. So that speaks to how much they're getting paid. But the Department of Education actually does get much more in total than the police department does. However, 
th it's a lot of information that I've been trying to compile in just the last couple of days, so I don't have all the numbers, but it does look like the Department of Education has a cut from last year and the police department has a growth mm -hmm. from last year. Yeah. So that's definitely that's some, something that people are upset about. And, you know, even though Department of Education gets more money, that doesn't mean that it's enough or it's being sent to the right places. So I can speak to those numbers Department of Education in total gets about $26.4 billion in this current budget, proposed budget, whereas the police department in this current proposed budget is going to receive about $5.4 billion. Yeah. In that budget to the Department of Education, I wrote this down. So there were three things that I pulled out that I thought were interesting. Two billion dollars of that goes to charter schools. 299 million goes to pre-K and 89 million goes to 3K, which when you're dealing with such high numbers, that actually seemed pretty low. So that was something that I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> that the city is able to offer 3K and pre-K to everyone for such a low number. 3K is the pre-K? For three-year-olds. Pre-K? Basically, yeah. It's a, from what I understand, it's an initiative to basically offer child care services to people that need it. Yeah. Yeah. So that seems pretty cheap for for what it's doing, you know. And 3K is a new program, right? Yeah, I I know about it from just knowing about things in general. So this isn't something that I researched this week. So the, the facts aren't fresh in my mind, but it is definitely something that de Blasio started within the last few years, several years. I don't, I actually don't remember if it was before his reelection or right after. I think there was there was a universal pre-K that he started that got him reelected, and then he added on the universal 3K, I think is how the timeline played out, but I don't know for sure. But it is one of the things that people point to when they want to say that he's doing a good job. And, and I agree, I think, I think, from what I know about it, that it's pretty good. And I think it's not to add on to the pile on to de Blasio, but I do think it's one of the only things that he's done that really he can stand up on. Um, but it's a good thing. So anyway, one, some numbers that I thought were related, because right now I'm, I in no me way I mean to compare just numbers between Department of Education and the police. There's a lot of other numbers here that I think would make more sense to compare. And I also think the Department of Education probably needs money sent to the right places within that to help that system. And I don't think by any means that I'm an expert on that. So I don't want to speak to it too much. But something I thought was interesting, just in terms of those numbers I just gave you, so $299 million for pre-K each year, $249 million for the school safety division of the police department. Okay. Just a fact. <laughs> Again, I really like, I'm not, I don't know the ins and outs of this. I'm just looking at the numbers, but that stood out to me. And we can get into what our opinions on it if you want, but I'm just going to read a couple more. So the biggest line item within the police pay was $500 million going just to overtime. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, actually, that's probably a relevant thing to talk about because they're getting paid overtime right now to mm -hmm. police the protests, right? Yeah. So that was worth thinking about. And then I also wrote down within the police budget that 8899000 is for the body cam every year. So I know that there's been a lot of people saying, you know, 
the police turn off their body cams sometimes or they don't always have it rolling when they should and it's something that has been put in place to try and reform the police department and you know when people are saying make sure that there's a policy that the police use their body cams we paid almost nine million dollars for those body cams so like yeah let's use them <laughs> <laughs> right i don't know I, that that was sort of my first thought when i saw that number like it's a lot of money to spend on something that may or may not be used and seems to be something that people want to have being used right to have some sort of transparency and oversight so some other inf interesting numbers that I'll throw out there and then maybe we can just have a conversation about it 1 billion or 1.5 billion goes towards child services so like child protective services and also about 1 billion goes to health and hospitals. Fire department numbers, they get also about, they actually get about 2 billion allocated to the fire department. Um, something that is related to our project, the libraries, 397 million. Okay. Okay. Ah, there it is. I was looking for the homeless services because that's also something we talked about. Homeless services gets 100 million. So I think we can, I can stop throwing numbers at you now because I've just given a lot of numbers without a lot of information around that. Mike, what are your thoughts? As I'm, as I'm saying that, I have some thoughts of my own because I've been reading about it a lot, but I'm curious what your thoughts are just right away. Are there any other items you didn't cover. It sounds. I'm just trying to think of the highest to the lowest. Uh, the education numbers is 26 billion, right? Yes. And then police was number two on what you had listed. Yeah, 5.5 .5 billion or yeah. so. But I guess there's all sorts of other services that, like sanitation, wasn't listed. I didn't. I didn't write that one down. Okay. Then roads. And... They're on. They're on there. It was. It's. 150 to 200 different categories mm -hmm. all blocked out and yeah I wrote down the ones that stood out to me yeah that I thought we could talk about today yeah I'm I guess I'd like to hear what your thoughts are first since you've had a little more time to think on it okay so I guess well so there's a couple of things which this I didn't actually talk to you about yet but Currently, the budget proposal is actually $9 billion over budget. So that's directly due to COVID and services that have had to be paid out and then also money not coming in. So 64% of the budget is made up of taxes, property tax, sales tax, income tax, all the taxes. So if people aren't working for three months, then obviously you're not getting taxes. And yeah, so, but de Blasio still wants to keep the budget at that nine billion over, which another important number is the debt services, which is at 4.6 billion, which I might be wrong about this, but I think what that meant is that that's the debt that we currently have. And the last time that our annual operating budget was massively over was in 1975 and it was after years of being over and the banks actually stopped loaning to New York because we were so irresponsible and we're still paying that off now. So I believe that that 4.6 million or billion is partially due to taking loans from banks and having a budget that's over all the way back in 1975. So there's definitely concern about having a proposal that's $9 billion over yeah. right now. And with my limit, you know, I don't know what a lot of these line items are. So I did spend a significant amount of time just trying to cut and not even reallocate. And we could cut the, the full police force and we still would be over budget. We'd still be over by $3 billion. Yeah. 
So I, I sympathize, or I, I don't sympathize, I empathize with the people that are trying to figure this out. It seems really challenging, but you know, that's also their job and they definitely get it a lot more than I do. So. Four billion seems low relative to what I know about the federal budget. Um, but, as far as debt? Yeah. Right. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how contemporary economists think about city debt versus federal debt or things like that. But yeah, there's going to be some sort of reckoning on all sorts of public budgets once we get to whenever the new fiscal year is and mm -hmm. things have to be made, you know. Yeah. So the new fiscal year starts July 1st. No. So the reckoning needs to happen now. <laughs> but it also, so another thing I did learn because I've been also reading a lot of things, you know, quick email your council members, this needs to pass now, tell them to vote no. And I, and I agree there is urgency, but there's also, this is all a proposed budget and then it can be changed at any time in the year, specifically at the quarters, mm -hmm. but it can be changed at any time. So when you go and look at what the city's actually been spending, there's the adopted budget, which is what people sign off on July, starting July 1st. And then there's the modified budget, which is what was actually spent. Right. So it's important to start with a budget that actually reflects what people want to see in their city, in their community. But that kind of put my anxiety to, at ease a little bit, knowing that changes could be made even beyond that July 1st point. Right. And, and even, I mean, yesterday, June 5th, was a date where typically it's figured out. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much that anxiety is real versus something that you feel as an individual versus something that a government entity should necessarily feel, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that there should always be pressure on our government to maintain a balanced budget and to have fiscal responsibility. But whether or not that actually impacts the, the health of a community is unclear to me relative to... Right. You know, relative to our money not being real and nothing <laughs> making sense about how our federal deficits work. That's know? a good point. I guess what I'm what I'm feeling anxiety about is less about balancing the budget and more about making sure that the things that are getting money reflect what the people actually want. And right now, in particular, there's a call to defund the police, and if things are going to be cut, I think that that's where things should be cut from. We're seeing right now that that's what people seem to want. And, you know, if the homeless services are only getting a hundred million, we could definitely we could definitely send some of that money over there if we're not gonna cut, or we could just cut <laughs> and then work with organizations that are already working with homeless services and get those pumped up to get the budget next year, something like that. I don't actually know how any of this works, but <laughs> this is my idea. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm personally thinking particularly about homeless services and thinking about moving police money over to other services because I have a personal experience with that where just a couple of years ago, I think I told you about it, I was coming home and I was going down the stairs in the subway and there was a guy who was just right in the middle of the staircase and he was clearly like he was on drugs or he was drunk or something but he was also I, pretty clearly homeless and he was just laying out on the stairs and people were like stepping over him and people were like somebody stepped on him and I really didn't know what to do but he seemed like I don't know, you know, sometimes you see people and you're like, oh, they're fine. And then sometimes you see people and you're like, they're not okay. Like that's, they're not okay. Like not, not like I'm not okay seeing this, but like that person's not okay and they need help. And so he wasn't okay and he, I, he needed help. And I called 911 and 
they showed up and they didn't help them. They just grabbed him off the stairs, pushed him up against a, a pole, put him down on the ground, and were like, oh, you again, causing trouble. And then, I mean, I felt terrible that I had involved the police and I should have known, I guess, I mean, now I know better, I guess, but I, don't, I still don't know. There needs to be a better system for that. There needs to be somebody that can come and help and not just, I certainly didn't call just to have this guy thrown from one place to another. I called because he was in distress and he, I thought if I called the agency that's supposed to help protect the people, that they would see this guy as one of the people and not just see him as a nuisance and some unnamed person. Right. So, I, I mean, it was obviously ignorant and naive to think that they'd show up and take him to a shelter or, ta or help connect him with services, which we do have in the city. Um, now I know, and maybe it's on me to just educate myself so that I could help the guy. But I also recognize that, especially once we're back into the hustle and bustle of living in New York, that's not going to be what people are spending their time doing. So these programs do need to exist to, to help and not to just hurt and keep people down. Mm -hmm. So getting back to the police budget. Yeah. You said it was 5 billion or thereabouts. 5.5. 5.5 yeah. billion. You listed a couple of line items. Were you able to find allocations for all of that 5.5? So this is the thing, it is a little bit confusing because I can tell you 5.1 is just pay. Pay and fringe benefits is what it says. It says that on all of it, so I think it's like accountant speak. 5.1 billion? 5.1 billion. Is just pay? Is just pay. So that's just salaries, I suppose. You know, 500 million of that is overtime. And then it does list it out. I didn't write everything down because, like I said, it's the big boxes. There's about 100, 150 or so. And then in each one of those, it's a, you scroll and you scroll and you scroll. That doesn't seem correct. That 400 million could supply all the station houses, all the vehicles, all the weapons, all the training everything that isn't going directly to officers. So services and expenses is listed at 122 million. I don't know if it does pay for the vehicles or the station houses. I don't know if those things need to be paid for every single year or if they're funded through the city or maybe they're in another area. Like this is a separate thing. This is not included in the 5.5 billion but the pension for police officers is under pension. So on the budget, this is like, I also don't know how to read this thing. So you're probably right. There's probably way more money going to even to things that are housed in different areas on that budget sheet. Yeah. So pension's but not a part of the five point. No, it's 2.5 billion. Is the pension. Is the pension. And it's not included in the 5.5 billion. Yeah. Yeah, but you make a good point. So there's also, for example, there's a line patrol services, and that's only 444000 And to me, that doesn't seem to add up to what the cost of actually being on patrol would be. Right. So I think reading the budget is really confusing, is basically what I've gotten from this. And I wish I had more answers, and maybe I can do more research and give you more information next week but this is basically like four days of me studying mm -hmm. for hours each day yeah and i still don't understand so much of it yeah which i think is actually that in itself like i can throw out these numbers and i think that's interesting and people can think on that and you know everyone can kind of come to their own conclusions and just think about what you think is worth putting money into and what you think is not worth putting money into. But I also think it's worth realizing that even though this is out there for public consumption, it's not really. 
it would be great if there was an effort to get it a little more digestible. Yeah, I think there is. And I mean, Julia worked, you know, she worked with the council to make this graph, which is way more digestible than what was is otherwise, right. you know. But clicking through, you don't find this. Yeah. Even this that's still hard to read, it's hard to find. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just not in their best interest to have everybody actually able to read it and understand it because then they'll be inundated with people wanting to share their opinions, which is what the whole system is supposed to be for, but... Well, the more <laughs> transparent you make it, the more easy it is to remove things. So there, there's, That's true. there's just not an interest in doing that. And there is yeah. also probably not the skill in all of the departments for there to be people that can represent it transparently too. Right. You know, you might just right. be dealing with people that aren't good at demonstrating what the finances are. Yeah. But I guess, I mean, I'm interested in learning more about it. I see so much, I hear something or I read something or I listen to something that makes me feel so hopeless and nihilistic for a few hours or a day or so. And then I see something else that makes me feel really hopeful and looks like forward momentum. And one of these things that did make me feel hopeful is that there was this big push to send emails to all the council members this week and people did that and it was specifically to cut funding for the police in the budget and to look over the budget and to vote no on the mayor's proposed budget. And there's been a lot of response from council members that we're gonna go through it line by line. We're specifically gonna look at what goes to the NYPD and cut that and this is inappropriate. And I guess I'm just hesitant to stop there because I feel like it's just so easy for them to placate us by saying, yeah, I hear you. I'm going to look through it line by line. And like, I know LA just cut $150 million off their police budget, which sounds great, right? Like when I first read that, I was like, wow, cool, $150 million? That's a lot of money. And then I, the next day, I looked at the New York City budget and realized that that's nothing. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's nothing. Right. So, I don't know. I've just been trying to understand these things a little bit more so that I'm not fooled as much anymore. I'm still going to be fooled. The whole system wants to fool us. Mm -hmm. So, it's still going to happen. But <laughs> I guess, yeah just trying to kind of take steps. And, I, and I'm hoping that as I look into this too, and I mean, maybe even someone listening to this will know of a direction to point us. There must be groups that are already learning this information. I'm sure there's people that already know this. I'm sure there's people that are trying to compile all of these things down into a more digestible manner. Hopefully, but you never know. I guess you don't know for sure. But hopefully, yeah. I would just assume that there would be. Yeah. I mean, the. it sounds like overtime is really one area where that could be cut down or should be cut down because mm -hmm. that guaranteed is being exploited in order to make more money. Yeah. And they're just – the instances where there is overtime probably are – like in many instances, times when people probably wouldn't even want the police to be around. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that seems like, yeah, that seems like something that could be cut down with further accountability. If we agree that there needs to be different training and a, or a total rethinking of what the police force is, if that wouldn't require money to make <laughs> that happen. So it's interesting. I think, so personally, at this very moment, um, and it's wild how much my feelings on this whole thing have shifted just as I've learned more and listened more. Because, I'll, I mean, I'll be honest about it. One week ago, right, I had a conversation with you where I was saying, 
don't you think a lot of this change needs to come from the inside? Don't you think that there's, you know, shitty people that are inside the police force that have macho attitudes that are taking over, that are peer pressuring people into thinking that their behavior is okay and making the system as bad as it is? And couldn't there be the good people inside the system that could stand up to that and fix it and twist it back to the way that, you know, it should be? Remember I was saying that like a week ago? Yes. <laughs> and now after listening, I've been listening to a bunch of different podcasts and I've been reading a bunch of different things and it comes from hearing what people are calling for in the protests, but then doing my own research. I don't feel that anymore. I feel like I was thinking that because I've been trained to think that the police are a good organization that are here to protect and serve. And I don't think that this, I don't think that the, I don't necessarily think that the specific people are all bad, but I do think that the whole system is bad. And so I think when people are saying that, you know, all cops are bad, the B doesn't stand for bad, but <laughs> when people are saying all cops are bad, um, what I hear and what my understanding of it, it's, it sort of sounds like shorthand for this system of policing is built on a racist system. And this police came from, ultimately, the reason that we have them is to keep people down. And the whole system is just broken and corrupt. So if you are a cop, your job is inherently bad. It doesn't mean that you are a bad person. It just means that you are choosing an inherently bad job. And you might be a good person. You might have your eyes closed to that fact. You might not know that. If you have your eyes open to that fact, I don't think you can say that you're a good person if you realize that your job is inherently bad. It might be conflicting. I think everyone has the opportunity to become, you know, to go on to the good side. Um, but yeah, I'm just realizing that the the actual police system itself is what needs to be dismantled. So when we talk about, or when you're saying that, you know, training and retraining will cost money, I think the way I see it is that ultimately the police system needs to be dismantled. And that can't happen overnight. Obviously, we can't we can say, hey, de Blasio cut the entire budget for the NYPD. We can say that as much as we want. He's not going to do that. There's going to have to be some sort of plan put in place for dismantling it slowly over time, putting money into other services, figuring out you know, how to help people through that shift. But I think that there is a way to take away enough money from one aspect, you probably will have to do some sort of training and retraining while you still have the police. Um, we probably can't neglect that. So in your media bubble, and I don't mean that in a negative way, we're all existing bubbles, but in your, I guess, media journey of the <laughs> past eight to 10 days, has there been any concrete ideas that you've heard with respect to dismantling the police that have resonated with you? Or is it more just an idea of like, they just need to go? I think I'm under, I'm honestly so new to the idea that I, I'm, I've been focusing on trying to understand what about this system is so bad, why they need to go. There are people that have specific plans, but I can't really speak to that yet. Mm -hmm. Can you think of an example either of where something was removed completely and then replaced effectively or the opposite something that was corrupt was reformed in a way that worked an example like in my life 
Or in general? Either. Probably in general. There hasn't been a lot of successful examples of things being reformed in our lifetimes. Yeah. Can you think of any? <laughs> Not, I mean, I don't know. The first thing that came to mind, I don't think is an example of either, but the subway system in the 70s when they were, mm. it was like graffiti covered and people were afraid of it and their response was to decommission subway cars anytime even a slight speck of graffiti got on it. Right. And then, and that worked. Like it, as, as far as I know, maybe there are people that would dissent to that idea, but the idea of like zero tolerance decommissioning of those sorts of things. I would, I would say that maybe similarly, there's just a zero tolerance policy for people that receive infractions or like you turn a, the three strike system like onto police officers. Yeah. Well, so I guess that's like, I've been totally disillusioned too, but we really don't, we talk so much about crime and then we see what police officers are doing and we want to say, oh no, you know, not all cops are bad, but they just do all these things with impunity. Like even looking at the, you know, the peaceful protests that are getting sprayed with tear gas and people are getting, what's it called, kettled mm. into groups and thrown on the ground just for being there, mm -hmm. just for doing something that's totally legal to do. Yeah. And, it, and there's no repercussion. And it's been like that for, for so long. And we've just like, I mean, we were watching that frontline thing the other night and. Yeah, policing the police. It's about the Newark Police Department from 2014 to 2016 or thereabouts. Yeah. Just following the, the department for a year. And it is worth watching. We can add it as a link on YouTube. It's only an hour long and there yeah there was some there's some great stuff on there yeah it was it was interesting but yeah I guess I mean even in that the you know they were interviewing some policemen and the interviewer was saying that when he was a kid and one of his first interactions with police was to be he was scary he was to, it was like a terrifying experience because they were aggressive with him and I think he said they threw him down on the ground and he hadn't done anything. And the he asked the police officer, you know, is that the way, right way to do it? And he was like, oh, yeah, well, you don't know. You know, we have a scary job and you just, you never know what you're up against. And sometimes you've just got to, you just have to do that to be safe. And it's safer for you and it's safer for me. And there's this whole way of speaking that, is so repulsive and so I think you talk to someone like that and it's impossible to have a real conversation because they're just like macho like yeah yeah this is just the way it is it's just the way it is get over it oh it's safer for it's safer for you and they use that and it like I mean it reminded me of when I went up to the police officer in Port Authority like eight or nine years ago that had the machine gun and I told him that seeing a man with a machine gun in Port Authority, regardless of whether it's police or not, made me feel super unsafe. And why are they walking around like that? And he basically, you know, he said a similar thing. Oh, well, if we weren't here, you'd feel less safe. And it's like, no, <laughs> I'm telling you that seeing you with a machine gun makes me feel unsafe and you're not hearing me. You're just repeating this language that for whatever reason is what they say that's like, oh, well, without us, you'd feel less safe. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, as a society, we've come to believe that. When we have, I mean, I'm not typically a target of the police, and I felt unsafe seeing them. And I do feel unsafe seeing them. Every single time I'm on the subway and police officers come on and I'm sitting down and the gun is right in my eye level, that doesn't make me feel safe. I feel way safer when there's some person that 
is maybe a little erratic coming onto the subway. And I know that like, I can just get off if something happens or like, it's also probably fine. It's just a person. The chances of something actually happening are so low. But when I actually see a gun, like at eye level, I don't feel safe. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, it's like recognizing these things and realizing that the whole system that we're just being told that it's safer for us. And I don't think it actually is. I don't see safety as the primary objective of a fully functioning police force. Mm. To me, it is about having a group of people that can follow up on things that happen that will happen in life. You know, mm. what do you do with somebody that's driving drunk? What do you do with somebody that has robbed something what do you you know yeah and if you've been victimized you wouldn't have the resources to just start from zero and figure out how to resolve that yourself you'd need ideally in a, in a society a, a collection of people that can handle that right and i guess i mean i would i would agree with that um there's a podcast i've been listening to about um the abolition of prisons that's been in, on my rotation over the last week or so and or that I've added to my rotation and I forget the name of it right now it's something like prisons um, it's a pretty <laughs> like straightforward name but I can we can also add that into the notes and there was a good point that uh, the woman that runs the podcast was talking about uh, one of the co-hosts and she said something to the effect of because she's for full you know she's a she's an activist for abolishing prisons not reform she's an abolitionist yeah and so a thing that people say a lot of the times is wow are you so like really everyone like what about the criminals like everyone out and she's like yeah that's that's what it means right. um and she was saying how it doesn't mean that, that, that there's not going to be crime and it doesn't mean that people aren't going to do things that are harmful or bad. That's just human nature. But the way that we deal with that really needs to change. And these systems that we've created are obviously not working. Um, there's plenty of people that are doing harm that are never going to go to jail. The people that are running our country, the people that are you know, they're, they're the people that do crime that are like white collar crime are often not caught. It's the people that do crime that is kind of more petty often that are caught. And then there's murderers and there's, you know, the big, the big crimes. Yeah, I mean, I think to say that we all need to flip the way we're thinking about it is incorrect because there are a lot of people that are already thinking about it in this way of, abolishing, defunding, and reform until we get there. Um, but I think those of us that haven't really given enough consideration to this, I think it's, it is definitely time for everyone to at least consider it, at least think about it yeah. in a rational way. Yeah. Well, yeah, things like abolishing the prisons and or abolishing the police would certainly be the adventure of our generation. And in a lot of ways, it would be super exciting. It would require a level of effort to do successfully that would be heroic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that part of the reason we think about it in those terms is because the concept of conservative has been kidnapped by authoritarians. Hmm. The concept of conservative, as I envision it, is more how do we take our existing systems and improve them? Mm. Mm -hmm. And right now that's not a reasonable dialogue we're having right now. 
so the only thing that seems reasonable is to totally redo things because there's nobody that can communicate the other side of the discussion. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I I would be excited if that happened because yeah. it would be it would be interesting to see what happened, and I would like to support it. I there would be constant pressure against that. There would oh, be Oh, absolutely. There would be very because it would be something that not only would be it would be contrary to what the rest of the globe is doing. There are police systems that function mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I mean when you're saying it's contrary to what the rest of the globe is doing, um, I guess I don't know enough about what the rest of the globe does to to know if that's a true statement or not. But I know I hear a lot about Scandinavian countries, for example, that have police forces, but they don't use weapons. They don't have guns. And maybe that's a place to start. Maybe in our in the effort towards fully defunding, maybe we start having less weapons and less guns that our police force are using. I mean, I know a lot of these murders don't use a gun. The murders, I mean, uh, police murdering people that they're capturing, for, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, George Floyd wasn't murdered with a gun, but Breonna Taylor was. And I know there would be so much pushback against that because so many people have guns in this country. But I don't know, it would be, a, that could be an interesting place to start make it less of a violent thing to be a police officer. Yeah, I do I do think that's low hanging fruit as far as I'm concerned, getting rid of the militarized equipment mm -hmm. that police officers have, mm -hmm. for starters. And I see, but once I start thinking down this path, that it doesn't it doesn't feel like a path to abolish. It feels like a reform path. That's true. That's true. Good point. Well, I guess, okay, so maybe it doesn't even really make sense for me to start creating ideas of how this could work because there's people that have been working on this for a long ass time <laughs> and there's act there's activists and there's abolitionists and maybe I should just continue listening to the Abolish Prisons podcast and learn more and not just start creating my own ideas um, because this isn't really, this isn't something I've been active with in the past. It's something I think about. I don't really, you know, I don't love the way that our system works. I don't, I've, I've always realized that there are problems, but I am new to realizing how incredibly cracked it all is. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, it's really only this, like, very, very fresh in my mind to even be thinking about defunding and abolishing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I would like to see, and, and we've had this experience before over the past few years with organizations that have tried to provide a contrast to our current administration. Mm -hmm. But I would just like to see effective leadership come up because I feel like I've been burned a couple of times over the past 10, 12 years, which would extend to Occupy Wall Street, not just even the past few years, mm -hmm. of, of there being either insufficient or a lack of leadership and vision and plan. And I don't know. I mean, I don't think we know what a leader looks like until it, they actually emerge. Right. But... Yes, I there are there are people that have been working on this. I also fear that we have our idea of what leadership is and we kind of take it on good faith that people are actually working towards something in the way that not even that we would, but the way that we have in our imagination that it should go. That a leader would, yeah. And then those things aren't actually there, you know. Mm. So I'm I think the media bubbles that we all exist in, again, not pejoratively bubbles, mm -hmm. is right now so disparate. I'm waiting and hoping for there to emerge more distinct ideas and leaders 
that can be f that transcend the individual uh, bubbles that we all exist in and get us mm. talking about a common path. Mm. Right now, defunding the police is, I think, the one thing that I you know that really exists in my bubble that's transcended. Yeah, and even that's a little soft for me. Okay, based on what you're even saying about the LAPD being defunded 150 million and that really being potentially a shell game of just like, yeah, okay, well, we'll, you know, we'll knock off a little bit of the overtime, mm. but everything's, you know, we'll calm down in a couple of weeks. Well, I don't think I'm getting that. I mean, I'm not realizing it's a shell game because of my media bubble. I'm realizing that because I looked at what numbers actually look like. No, no, I'm not saying that the media is saying that it's a oh, shell okay. game. I'm saying that we are, based on our conversations, recognizing that that particular objective is very susceptible to sweeping under the rug. I see what you mean. Yeah. Now, it would be, I've been thinking about it kind of like the Hong Kong Five Demands, mm -hmm. which I don't know offhand, <laughs> but the, even the idea that I can reference that protesters had five things that they could say during the protest that they could have online, that people could know what right. they are, that could potentially be forwarded. If there were something that were similar to that, I would start feeling a lot more comfortable. I think that's a good point, and I hope that that happens. I also think part of um, the language and the shorthand, it's been a process for me to understand, and I fall into, you know, I'm young, I'm progressive, I, I totally, like, fit the bill for people that would back these things and want to, like, get involved, and... I didn't understand a lot of it and had to do some research and um, definitely like talking to other people that aren't quite as young or progressive or involved in what's going on. They didn't get it at all. <laughs> and then sharing my knowledge, but it would be great if the language and the shorthand was maybe um, a little more inclusive too. And in what respect? In just in the respect of something that that more than just the super progressive young people can understand and push forward i i do think that if things are going to move forward in any sort of significant way there needs to be language like i so we spoke about this the other day too that the me too movement really sort of affected people in all it didn't stop on political lines it definitely i mean it was more on the left but it did filter out and i think it it created language that people could use and people could understand and maybe it was confusing at first but it very quickly defined itself and i think if there's anything that's going to be long lasting and sort of spread around to more than just one bubble, as you say. Um, I think knowing how to talk about it is really important. And I like, it's in no way a judgment on how things are being done now, because obviously the, the word is getting out and it is filtering and we are understanding it. But I, I hope that there's a push moving forward to, to sort of say things in a way that aren't polarizing and are, you know, are said in a way that people can really get behind it and then change can actually happen from more than just one side. And it can be the same exact thing, you know, it's just the way that it's said can either anger people or excite people. So I don't know, that's why I've been focusing on thinking about the system of police as a broken and racist system inherently, as opposed to focusing on the individual people. Regardless of what my personal thoughts are on that, um, I'm trying to just share the idea of the system because I think that's something that translates to a lot of different people. Translates as far as 
people understand that idea? I think I think it's easier for people to understand that the systems because people get defensive. People get to oh, I know. Oh, I know a cop or I have a friend that's a cop or, you know, I'm a cop and I'm not a bad person and you're attacking me. And like, regardless of like whether or not I feel like all cops inherently are bad people. I'm just going to focus on saying that the system is bad because <laughs> that's the thing that it takes it takes a lot of the shame off of people and like it takes a lot of the defensiveness out of the conversation. Yeah. I mean, and not that that's like anyone's responsibility, sorry. But like like it's, you know, there's there are there is a method to like enacting change through shame and that's like if other people want to do that, that's great. That's fine. Like I'm, I'm like, I'm not judging that at all. Um, I just think my way of moving forward talking about it is to focus on communicating in a way that people will hear and not just jump to feeling attacked or feeling defensive and, and shutting down. Right. Yeah. I've, for whatever reason, been thinking biblically recently mm, okay. about this. Lay it on me. And some some aspects more casually that I don't have elaborate thoughts on, but the idea of you know removing the plank from your own eye before you remove the speck from somebody else's eye. That's gotcha. It. Yeah. I'm familiar with that? Yeah. That's a New Testament thing. Okay. As well as... Do you want to say that again for... I mean, like, you have Catholic school background. I have some church background. Um, not a ton, but I was able to process that pretty quickly. I think I've heard someone say something similar, but... What, this phrase speaks for itself pretty well. Yeah. The idea being that you fix your own faults before you fix the faults of others. Right. And you're saying the plank and the speck is like... If you're noticing the tiny little thing that someone that's wrong with someone else, then maybe you need to do some self-reflection and realize the massive thing that could potentially be wrong with you, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Also, I think it's a lot easier to remove a plank than it is a speck, <laughs> and it's a lot easier to do surgery on yourself than get somebody hold somebody down and try and you know get some dust out of their eye. I mean, this is kind of freaking me out to think about it so much <laughs> in this physical way, um, but. That's a that's a fun point. But yeah, yeah I think yeah. you'd be really hard pressed, even the person most loyal to the concept of a police institution, to suggest that the blame here exists on people of color and not the system. Like you would you would really have to bend over backwards in order to preserve something that's irrational. Although there are definitely people that are doing that yes, and thinking but I don't, that way. But, and but that's, <laughs> but yes, but that's always going to exist. Yeah. And so you can't worry about those, that percentage of people. Yeah, that's true. So there's that. And I also think about another New Testament thing, which right. was uh, Jesus and the money lenders. Familiar oh, with that? Oh, yeah. Zac Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. I'm not there sure. There was a song we used to sing about the guy that the tax collector that went up into the tree. I don't know. Okay. This is not the story I'm referring to. Okay, tell me the story you're referring to. Again, this is meant to be short, but the idea that anger was within Jesus's tool bag. It's the mm -hmm. it is the the instance in the Bible where uh, anger was expressed by Jesus. And mm. that's going to the temple and seeing the money lenders in front of the temple and mm. flipping over the tables and basically engaging in a, a riotous act Wow! in order to demonstrate that it was uh, un uh, you know, unethical to uh, lend money to people with interest. So just, yeah, the idea that there is a, a place for righteous anger so it's New Testament. And then the one that I thought about most recently that I did a lot more thinking about was the Old Testament, which is Ecclesiastes 3, okay. which is the section to every time there is a season. Oh, yeah. 
which was turned into a song by Pete Seeger, mm -hmm. Turn, 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 which was then done by The Birds. Okay. And has the distinction of being the song, the number one song with the oldest lyrics. Oh, interesting. It was written in 10,000? 10, uh, 10, it was written in 1000 BC okay. by King Solomon. And that is, you know, a time a time to rip and a time to repair and mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, a time to love and a time to hate, mm -hmm. which is something that I've been thinking about recently. It actually struck me as very Buddhist in a way, or what we, our contemporary understanding of Buddhism is. Okay. And how I think of the Old Testament and I think the general idea of it is kind of like a vengeful thing. And it's it, right. almost like a historical telling of the Jewish history. And then there's kind of laws of behavior, you know, like the Ten Commandments. And, mm -hmm. and then all of the, you know, the uh, in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the idea of how to prepare, you know, food and how right, to right, right. cleaning and things mm -hmm. like that. And this was a thing that actually was a like more aware than even the new testament in some ways when i think about it mm. because it permits the concept of hate and that allowed me to think a little bit more about what i'm seeing on the internet mm. in my social media bubbles and and where yeah, I guess social media bubbles. Reddit doesn't count as news, you know, but like <laughs> the idea of of that space. Yeah. Where people are saying, you know, I hate the police and every every right. everybody is bad. There is right. no exceptions here. And I can't seem to bring myself to that space emotionally. Mm -hmm. I can feel other things. I can feel anger. I can feel sorrow. Mm -hmm. I can feel shame in a very complex way mm -hmm. that I've been thinking about. But I haven't been able to feel hate. I don't really want to feel hate, and that might be part of it. It might be part of privileged upbringing. I also, when I think about some of my earliest memories, though, I also just recall feelings of empathy in a way that I feel like would predate imprinting of privilege or, you know, mm. where like I think about like going to sporting events and, you know, clearly having a team that I'm supposed to be rooting for. Right. And then feeling really bad for the team that's down. OK. And then the team getting up that was the team that's down and instantly feeling regret and feeling bad for the other team oh, and just, you know, yeah. not having the very fundamental concept of sports to being like, no, it's, it's OK. Like you can you can hate that one team because like this is a safe space to just like have these feelings. You right. know? And so. I guess where I'm thinking about this is. I don't have that interest or capacity as far as I can tell to achieve that level of hate mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But I can respect that there are people that are having that feeling. And in this very particular time, this set of circumstances. That is propelling, you know, that is a thing that gets people to notice yeah. and gets change to happen. And that can be a type of person and then there can be other people having other feelings but in the direction of change right i mean i think that series of verses that ecclesiastes 3 i don't think that the time refers to the way that we think of time as an all-encompassing thing that everyone is in at the same time <laughs> so i don't think that necessarily like when we think about if we think if we think about this as being a time for hate other people could be having a time for love it's there's also a time to live a time to die so i think that 
understanding would have to be applied to all the other time for this, time for that. Well, as I would stop you in the respect that you keep actually switching between four and two. And that was something that I made note of when I was reading oh. it. It's not a time four. It's a time two. Two. And for me, that feels a lot more like internalized, not like mm. the ambient surroundings of the world. That's what I think of when I think of four. Yeah. When I think of two, I think of that is something that exists within you. I'm glad you clarified that because I think that's the point I was trying to make and I was not using the right words. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking this whole time, you know, we're seeing this, we're seeing a lot of, and again, in the social media bubbles, I've been seeing a lot of people focusing on telling people off for being angry or for being hateful. And, you know, the media is kind of loving it because it's a story every day and it's, gets people more riled up than just showing the peaceful protests um, to show the, the bits that are riotous and whatnot. And I, from as soon as I saw someone reacting like that, I immediately felt off, you know, like, why are you jumping to judge this? Why are you so outraged that there are people that have been oppressed for a really long time that are angry and are showing their anger. Like, why are, why are people getting so angry about this and condemning it? And I, I, not that I necessarily condone violence, but I certainly don't think it's up to me to condemn it. Um, and then I've, and I was actually trying to think about it from a biblical standpoint too, and realizing that there's this, you know, we're not supposed to judge but then getting really tripped up on, well, if I'm not supposed to judge how people are expressing their anger, and if I share that, which I think is correct, I think, you know, unless someone's getting murdered or if people are physically getting hurt, like, I get it. I get the expression of anger, of course. But if I say that, then am I a hypocrite for being judgmental of how the police are acting. And I actually heard something today that referenced this in the Bible. I think it was a Corinthians thing talking about how when we see sin, there's no judgment needed. Mm -hmm. And so the murder and the physical violence that's being, that's happening from the police to the citizens just falls into that category of sin. Uh -huh. And that's, we know that that's wrong. <laughs> um, whereas being angry doesn't fall into that category. So there yeah. was something innate in me that picked up on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I was happy to start to understand it from a more intellectual side of things too. Yeah, well, there I think there is a difference between anger and hate too i'm making that yes i would agree with that for and sure i don't think that it is a place to live in forever no and again like i said i have a harder time accessing it but yeah i i think that people are condemning it because it's very powerful it's a very powerful mm -hmm. energy and because it has the power to change things. Yeah. And everybody is on a different timeline. Yeah. And also people have different levels of investment in this current system. And so I've been thinking a lot about the idea of how I personally achieve things mm -hmm. both like on a day-to-day -day basis and then like on a longer term basis and I've been thinking about it like I think a common experience that would be instructive is the idea of procrastination mm. and I think a lot of people when they procrastinate they find they actually get things done but they don't get things done that they they want to, that they need to do you know right. i need to write this paper 
I ended up cleaning my room before I wrote the paper. Right. You know? And there are little tricks that everybody plays every day, or I play with myself. Mm -hmm. And then there are also things that on a longer term basis where it's like I have this big goal for myself, but then there's this other big goal and I move that up in front. Yeah. And I think that there have been a lot of people that have been putting this idea of fixing something like the police and having a, a more just society to the side because it felt overwhelming or because they had a job or they, cut, they there were things that were keeping it from being at the forefront. Yeah. And right now we're in a place where that is not the case. Yeah. And so for a lot of reasons, a lot of people are ready to do this thing. And that could potentially be interfering with people who don't feel that urgency. Right. And as a consequence, they will push back. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's another layer that I've been thinking about, too, which I think it's just really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people are not able to be uncomfortable. That's true. And, and when confronted with what we're confronted with right now, if you haven't been practicing feeling uncomfortable or vulnerable or awkward or unsure, then all of a sudden having to practice those feelings when we're dealing with disparity between races, like that is so hard. <laughs> And I, and I think it needs to happen. It, it's not an excuse at all for people that are not able to join the conversation, but that's how I've been kind of trying to understand it. Because we don't really, as a society, we shy away from things that are uncomfortable. In general, we shy away from uncomfortable conversations. We shy away from things that are physically uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't think that's unique to our society. I mean, I think inherently Human. inherently something that's uncomfortable is a thing that most people will avoid. Yeah. You were talking about how at this moment in time when people are usually able to procrastinate and push things off and focus on whatever their work or social engagements or things like that, how at this moment in time, people aren't doing those things. And so there's really no excuse. And this is finally able to come to the forefront of a lot of people's minds. And I've been thinking about how in our lives, there have been these moments, right, where there's there have been protests, there have been moments of something that seems like some change is going to come. Maybe there's some minor thing that happens. And do you think at all that because people are in the position they're in right now and aren't just going to go back to work, do you think that this has some sort of longer lasting ability? Or do you think that the news cycle is going to come in and distract us or like do you have any ideas on how this might play out i think it goes back to what i said earlier which is that i would really like there to be a slogan essentially mm. of what the objectives are i recall when occupy wall street was happening being involved with protests there trying to get something happening there and a persistent criticism that ended up bogging it down was what are your demands who is your leader yeah and should that be a thing that is required in a movement that's kind of debatable i don't know but what i do know is that people that will be the ultimate tipping point require that type of easy access in order for there to be something substantive to happen yeah. So. And I think, I mean, you even just the question you asked, is that a requirement for a movement? I guess no, 
but isn't movement about actually moving. Right. <laughs> and do, the way to get things done is to have some sort of clear agenda. So yeah, a movement as a noun, maybe not, but movement as a verb, probably. Yeah, and I mean, you know, also there is a scenario that plays out which is not some place that we want to go where there is an overthrow without a purpose. Right. It yeah. seems inconceivable, but a lot of things have seemed inconceivable that have been happening. It's true. And, you know, does this end up like France, you know, in the 1790s or in the Robespierre era? Maybe that was early 1800s. I don't know. Somebody can fact check me on the it's internet. It's not going to be me. But there are evidences of progressive movements in the history of humanity right. that have been mob-led and ultimately chaotic and non-functioning. Right. And yeah, I, I hope that doesn't happen. I don't perceive that to happen, but I haven't been able to perceive a lot of things that have happened. So yeah. and these are unique circumstances. Yeah. Well, I think we're at a really um, wonderfully potentially pivotal time where all eyes are on this movement. And I mean, there, there were protests in every single state in our country and I think in 13 other countries around the world that were all related to Black Lives Matter and the mistreatment of people by the police. And that's, that's pretty amazing. Like, I haven't seen that. I don't know when the last time something like that has happened. And so, yeah, and not to put more pressure on the people that have already put this together, but I do think it's important to capitalize on this, on this momentum. Um, and in this moment where there is a, all eyes are on the platform, so the platform should know what it's saying. I, I would make a major distinction between um, this and Occupy Wall Street. I mean, there's a number of major distinctions, but I do think that there is already, there have been clear things that are being said. Like we're not talking about, not even talking about prisons. Prisons are connected to police. I'm talking about prisons. I'm thinking about it. But the movement isn't even talking about prisons. They're talking about defund the police. No yeah. justice, no peace, defund the police. Like I those would, are the things. I so, would agree that this already has a complexion that's different from what the Occupy Wall Street thing was. Yeah. I think that there is a lot more infrastructure and I think that there are people within these movements that are interested and capable of being leaders. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of how, if they will ascend. Yeah. So. Yeah, and to a point, and also like, I'm sure you and I are ignorant to some of the leadership that already exists. There is leadership. There are, there are organizers working together, clearly, you know, working hard and making it happen. None of this would really be happening if there wasn't some sort of clear organization. I think it's more um, outward facing is what we're not seeing. Yeah. 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 And I'm hopeful. I mean, I, I do think that I hope that something can pop up like that. Well, I feel like there's a lot more we could talk about, but I also think we've probably reached the limit for what the episode length should be. Okay. So we can reserve it for another time. But thanks so much to everyone for watching and listening. It is our intention to do a podcast every Tuesday. Of course, that was derailed last week. So who knows what will happen next week. We do have some ideas to maybe do a podcast related to our clothing next week. But again, we'll see if that's relevant to the moment or not. If it doesn't seem appropriate, then we won't do that. But yeah, just keep Keep your eyes peeled. We'll let you know when things are coming your way. If you've clicked that little bell, then you'll get an email. And otherwise, you know, if you're connected with us on social media, we usually post about it when things are coming out. Um, and just keep 
checking in. Yeah, yeah. All the platforms are online now. So we have the YouTube, we have Podbean, which is where you can download the episodes, as well as Apple Podcasts, mm -hmm. as well as Google Play. Spotify. Well, and we're on Spotify too. Yes, and Spotify, uh, which is streaming. So yeah, thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Would love to hear any feedback anyone has. And take care. Bye. Bye.